Okay, well, uh, thank you, David, for inviting me to do this and for the introduction. Um, so as as David uh, described, I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist. I, I, I do computational and neurophysiological studies of the brain. Um, but I, I'm actually not going to talk very much about my own work in this talk. Um, this is going to be more of a talk where I try to synthesize the work of many other people. Uh, some of whom, some of whom I haven't even met, um, in an attempt to get a kind of a big picture theory of uh, the organization of behavior at the neural level. Um, and I'm going to start um, really with a common assumption in the field, which is that the brain is best described as an information processing system. In other words, uh, a system that takes information from the outside world um, builds knowledge, makes decisions, and produces some kind of motor output. Um, and that the principal function of the central nervous system is to represent and transform information. This is a common way of describing what the brain does. Um, <clears throat> now, traditionally, information processing systems um, were defined in a kind of a computer metaphor, uh, where there's sensory input from the environment, which is processed in some kind of a um, storage or working memory or some kind of temporary buffer where the knowledge can be manipulated to make inferences, make decisions, and then um, produce some kind of plan of action, which is then executed through the effectors. And Newell and Simon over here described this in, in a kind of a computer metaphor with symbolic processes. Um, but that's also the underlying concept in more modern neural network-like approaches where the processing takes place through matrix multiplication of vectorial representations of things. Um, and now one reason I think that um, describing brain function in terms of information processing, um, one reason why this is very attractive is because if you know, if you can measure the inputs and the outputs, then you can infer the intervening computation that might be going on inside the black box, be it symbolic or vectorial. And if that computation is very sophisticated, then you can propose a hypotheses on how it breaks down into sub-computations um, that produce some intermediate representation. And so therefore, you can subdivide a large problem into smaller problems, each of which is also some kind of information processing system. Um, and furthermore, this putative intermediate representation can then make a prediction about what kind of thing you could find in the brain uh, when you record from neurons or do functional imaging or something. Um, so it gives us a kind of a approach for subdividing functional decomposition of a big problem like all of behavior into subproblems like perceptual, cognitive, or motor control problems, each of which can be subdivided further into more specific uh, functions, each of which can be thought of as some kind of an information processing uh, function. Now, this, of course, is a, a very sort of sketch, sketch, impoverished sketch of how we think about behavior. Uh, but the particular concepts define the questions we ask because they define the sort of domains we study. For example, I study decision making. Other people might study attention or working memory. Um, so the questions then we ask are, how does the brain represent the information through neural activity patterns, et cetera? How does it achieve coding efficiency, decoding accuracy, et cetera? We can ask, what is the computation that's performed by a given region? Uh, does some region encode information about the world? Does it store it, retrieve knowledge, make decisions, et cetera? Um, and then <clears throat> the task then is to produce a study of mental processes uh, concerned with problems of how internal representation and states of mind are generated by the brain. This is a quote from the major textbook in neuroscience, uh, which, which expresses this general assumption. Um, so now the task is to try to find what are the computations, understand the functions of different brain regions or circuits in terms of specific computational functions. Now, um, as many of you know, uh, this approach uh, meets many challenges. Um, some of these are neural challenges, um, that things don't look perhaps as one might expect. So for example, one would expect that there should be a unified um, representation of let's say, the visual world in the brain somewhere. But instead, we see a divergence of information, dorsal and visual streams um, concerned with where things are and what things are. 
uh, multiple maps of space, mul multiple ways of processing information about objects. Uh, so something that should be unified is uh, instead appears to be very distributed. Uh, conversely, things that we think should be distinct are mixed. So for example, we see um, the same regions encoding sensory, motor, and cognitive variables, sometimes the very same cells. So for example, area LIP over here, one tradition of studies has um, interpreted as a, more of an attentional system that might be seen as the input to cognition and thinking. Another tradition of studies sees the very same cells as the intention that's produced by cognition, sort of from the decision that's being made. Uh, and this is common around throughout these regions. And things that are ser should be serial appear to be, in fact, parallel. You'd think you make decisions before you prepare actions, but instead we see decisions and actions emerging in parallel across many regions of the cortex, almost everywhere where we have looked. So cerebral cortex, basal ganglia, superior colliculus, et cetera. And in general, um, everything seems to be pretty distributed. Most regions are involved in many functions. This is from the work of Michael Anderson and colleagues who sort of did a meta-analysis of many studies of functional imaging studies, suggesting what functions have been ascribed to different regions. And most regions have been ascribed a large diversity of different functions. Now, in addition to the neural challenge, there are some conceptual ones. One is the binding problem. If you have this diverging information about, let's say, where things are versus what things are, how is that bounded to knowledge of what is where? Um, another problem, perhaps even more fundamental, is sometimes called the grounding problem. How do we, how do the representations that are passed from system to system convey their meaning? How does this system here know what this um, representation really means? Uh, not the syntax, but the semantics. And this is a very old problem that's been identified a long time ago already in classical AI. It was called the framing problem. It's the root of Searle's famous Chinese room argument, uh, or what Harnett called the symbol grounding problem. And we and many others have suggested that it underlies the apparent lack of understanding in large language models. Um, now, possible conclusions are that <clears throat> for these challenges that maybe we're not looking at the data correctly. Maybe we need more data. Maybe we need better recording and decoding methods. Uh, maybe we need more elaborate theories that explain how information is bound together from different streams, how meaning is encoded, et cetera. But another possibility that I think is worth considering is that the traditional model is just wrong. Um, not completely wrong, but it, it makes some mistakes in some of its basic assumptions and some of the conceptual distinctions. Um, in other words, perhaps this is not the right way to break down the problem of behavior. And I think it's worth asking this um, when you consider where does this really come from, this, this sort of taxonomy of, con of concepts that we have? Um, who do we cite for this? Um, and I actually would suggest that the origin of this concept is very old. In fact, it comes from pre-scientific philosophy, in particular dualism. The idea that there's a non-physical mind which dominated um, the philosophy and was essentially, when psychology was founded, this was the basic assumption. And so if, if you assume that there's a non-physical mind, then it forces you to conceive of interfaces between the physical world and that non-physical mind. So perception, is sort of the way the world is presented to the mind through the lens of attention. And action is how the mind plays out its intentions onto the world. Now, of course, this concept of the non-physical mind has been rejected. Uh, and instead, it's been replaced by this concept of a cognitive system that's a computation, some kind of a computational process. But the architecture remains. And, I, and the architecture remains in part because these are just the terms that we use to discuss behavior, that the very terminology with which we phrase questions about behavior has become so embedded in this kind of dualistic tradition. Uh, and then the question is, well, what well, the concern is, what if these are not the right terms? And I'm by no means the first person to ask that. Uh, Paul and Patricia Churchland asked this 40 years ago. Lisa Feldman Barrett, Russ Poldrack, Yuri Bozaki, Michael Anderson, many others have um, raise this issue. Perhaps this is just not the right way. We assume this, but maybe it's wrong. Now, if it's wrong, of course, then the question, of course, that comes up right away is, well, what's the alternative? How else to think about what the brain is doing, if not these kinds of information processing functions? And also importantly, how do we subdivide the problem? Because we probably can't just solve it all at once. We need some way of subdividing. Um, 
So in my talk, I'm going to make two controversial claims. Um, <clears throat> one is that the brain is not best described as an information processing system. That instead, it's better to think of it as a feedback control system. In other words, um, the task of the brain is not to transform input into output, but rather to control the input via output through the environment. In other words, the input tells you how you're doing, what your state is, and you want to perform actions that bring you to a good state, avoid predators, bring you towards food, et cetera. And you have to produce this, the kind of output that through the environment will result in the right input. So it's a feedback control system. Now, of course, that also involves information processing, but it's a very specific type of information processing. It's a very special case. And therefore, it provides a more precise description um, for, um, for uh, understanding the brain. And I would say that this is actually not controversial at all. I, I don't really think anyone could disagree that the whole point of having the brain is to do something useful that benefits you. Um, so this claim actually isn't that controversial. What's more controversial is my second claim, which is that accepting the first claim changes everything. Uh, and by that, I mean the functional decomposition, the kinds of representations and mechanisms we might uh, seek in the brain, and the kinds of questions we ask about it. Um, so I think uh, this is going to be a little bit more difficult to defend, uh, and I'll, I'll try to do that in the rest of my talk. <clears throat> Um, and I'll do it by asking first how to subdivide the problem, how to take the big problem of behavior into something more manageable, because uh, I think that's where some insights could come. And I would suggest that instead of just defining what the subdivisions are or using ones that we've inherited from ancient philosophers, let's consider what a strategy for doing so might be. And to do that, I would recognize, I would, I would suggest that although we don't know what the real functional distinctions might be, we do know where they come from. Of course, they come from evolution. Um, now, as Dobzhansky famously said, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. And I would agree. Um, and so the proposal is that we follow in the footsteps of evolution and consider how the system elaborated and modified over time to try to get an idea of what the functional distinctions are. Um, and uh, that's what I'm gonna do. But first, I want to just dispel some myths, some very common myths about evolution that many people hold. Uh, and one of them is that evolution is nature's way of finding solutions, optimal ones perhaps, to problems posed by the world. But that's not exactly true because evolution doesn't actually identify the problems at all, right? It just produces variations of a functioning, an functioning ancestor and then just favors those which happen to accomplish something that used to be a problem. Right, so it it sort of stumbles onto things, uh, to solutions to problems that, that haven't been identified at the start. So it has no goal, it has no metric for success, except of course general survival. Um, and importantly, for a variation to even enter into the game of natural selection, it must first be possible as a modification of a functioning ancestor. And this constrains the variations very much because. The genome is not a blueprint for the body or a connectome for the brain. It's a recipe. It's a recipe that describes a developmental process that proceeds through a, a series of stages. Now, as in any recipe, you can't just arbitrarily change the steps. If you change, let's say, the first step, even if it's potentially useful, you will violate the assumptions under which the uh, um, subsequent steps function. And so you'll create a big mess. And so evolution can't just redesign completely. It can do only certain things that it's constrained to do. Um, one, it can elaborate, e elongate the developmental process to do more um, modifications of something. Um, it can differentiate systems and then specialize them differently. Uh, it can back up and abandon certain pathways. Um, so that means that the, the, the system that we have is highly constrained by the history. It's highly dependent on what that ancestor was. Um, now, I would say this is actually... Somebody's got their microphone on. Maybe they could turn it on. Srijan, I think. Anyway, um, sorry. Uh, so I would say this is actually good news because 
because of these constraints, it actually makes it possible for us to reconstruct what the ancestor might have been if we look at um, a diverse range of descendants. And um, also, it gives us a kind of potential taxonomy, at least in neuroanatomical or developmental terms, of, this, of the systems that actually exist now. Um, so to follow in the footsteps of evolution, the proposal is instead of defining, starting with definitions of things like cognition, attention, etc., cetera, um, which are usually based on fairly old ideas about the human mind, uh, we can consider how mechanisms were actually differentiated and elaborated over evolutionary time. So I've, this, I've called this phylogenetic refinement, but all it is really is applying the comparative method of biology to theoretical neuroscience. Uh, so the idea is you infer a sequence of innovations using the comparative method, comparing across species. And then to understand some structure of function, X, you always ask first, what was it before it became that thing? And how did it expand behavioral capacity? How did it help? And then always follow a chronological sequence because every stage provides the context and the constraints for the next one. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so here's the phylogenetic tree of animals expanded almost exclusively on the lineage that produced humans. Um, these branch points are where we diverge from different species. Uh, the thick lines are where there's fossil evidence for that. <clears throat> um, and I'm going to go through this. Um, and I'm going to go very, very quickly. It's going to be a bit hard to assimilate it. Um, and so the take home message that I'd like you to get is that it's a continuous process of progressive elaboration and specializations as these animals enter different niches and modify their nervous system. Um, and I'm going to start way off to the left in the origins of life about 3.8 billion years ago. Um, and there's a general consensus that life began with autocatalytic sets. So essentially closed loops of chemical reactions where some enzyme catalyzes the production of another enzyme that catalyzes another, et cetera, forming a closed loop. Once you have this, you have a primitive kind of metabolism and replication. And I'm going to list the sort of the people whose work I base, base my conclusions on over here. Now, <clears throat> once you have these kinds of closed autocatalytic sets, then they will uh, replicate and, and, and thrive. And now we can distinguish two kinds of metabolic control. Um, once these systems become enclosed in a membrane, we can distinguish between internal control, where some nutrient concentration, let's say, is controlled through internal chemistry that exploits the, the properties of the sort of um, organic chemistry. Um, from We can distinguish that, which we call physiology, from the case where um, a compound can't be produced internally and is non-uniformly distributed in the world. If that's the case, and you find yourself where you don't have enough of some required nutrient, well, then all you'd really need to do is move, even randomly, wave some flagella, wave some cilia, and move randomly to improve your chances to bring yourself to a place where there is whatever you need. Uh, and that's behavior. Essentially, behavior is a kind of metabolic control which extends through the environment to, to exploit the environment um, to bring you to a desirable state. And many people have said this over many years. So in other words, we can think of a behavior control system as... If, you, if your nutrient state is not um, as good as what, you, what you'd like, then you have some drive, we can call it hunger, or we can call it impetus for action, which motivates something like movement, even random movement, which then has the outcome, the outcome through the environment of improving your nutrients. Um, and so now we can think of this as a kind of a feedback system for controlling nutrient balance. Um, in other words, the task of behavior, um, there's very little here about knowledge or anything like that. The task of behavior is really to complement the dynamics of the environment such that the whole system um, is a stable system that flows towards desirable states. Uh, and a net negative feedback circuit accomplishes this. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm not the first to say this by any means. Uh, for example, John Dewey said this over 120 years ago. He said, what we have is a circuit. Motor response determines the stimulus just as truly a sensory stimulus determines movement. He wrote this in an article criticizing a stimulus re response paradigm of psychology at the time, um, uh, emphasizing this, this sort of closed loop nature. <clears throat> now, given this, uh, it's not surprising, perhaps, that the neurons first appeared as a specialization of the external um, 
layer of multicellular animals, the ectoderm, um, as a diffuse net across the cup-shaped body. Uh, and these early animals had a special specialization in the nervous system, the apical nervous system, rich in sensory uh, and chemosensory and photosensitive receptors, and a blastoporal nervous system controlling the contraction around the blastopore. And these animals uh, moved around the world in something called levy walks, where you make sort of uh, many, many small movements, exploiting some patch, and every once in a while make a longer range movement to move to a new patch. And this is a very efficient way, um, a minimalistic, efficient way to cover non-uniformly distributed uh, nutrients. Um, and Thomas Hills and others have suggested that modulating between these two modes of activity was the original role of dopamine, the neurotransmitter dopamine. So if you're if you're in a rich patch and you're absorbing, your intake rate is good, your dopamine levels are high, and that uh, motivates you to keep sort of this kind of local movement. But if you start to deplete the patch, your dopamine levels drop, and that releases this more long-range movement, which moves you presumably to a new patch. And so the idea then is the apical nervous system would sort of be informing the blastoporal nervous system to change it from these different uh, phase relationships to produce different uh, kinds of movement. Um, so now we can take this simple behavioral control system and elaborate it a little bit. All right, now we have a more complicated system, uh, which is dependent on different conditions. So for example, the impetus for local exploitation or making these small movements is if you're hungry and if there is food present and if your intake rate is good. Then if you do that, you make these small movements, which causes you to intake some nutrient, which is good, but also causes you to deplete the food. And if you've depleted the food before you've satisfied your hunger, then you have a new condition, the impetus to explore, which is no, not enough food, but you're still hungry. And then you make a long range movement, which hopefully brings you to a state of higher food. Now, um, the apical nervous system um, uh, controlled this through the secretion of these various hormones and neurotransmitters, and the blastoporal nervous system implemented these sort of modes of activity. Now notice what makes this system adaptive is that every closed loop, the total sign is negative. Um, and that means it's stable, that it approaches a desired state, which is going to be one of eliminating hunger. Uh, and that's what makes it adaptive. Now notice what happens if we ignore the environment's contribution. So these gray lines, which depict the environment's contribution to the system. If we do this, then we don't see, we lose that adaptive um, structure. And Dewey said this, again, 120 years ago, the reflex arc theory, stimulus to response, gives us one disjointed part of the process as if it were the whole, or in fact, what we have is a circuit. Um, so we need to think about always this uh, control system. All right, so anyway, um, <clears throat> this architecture of apical and blastoporal nervous system has been, still can be seen in nadarians like jellyfish and anemones, et cetera. But in our branch, the bilaterians, the body elongated, the blastopore fused into a tube, um, the digestive tube, and the apical and blastoporal nervous systems merged the one end of the body where the head would be. And this organization can still be seen in protostomes, which includes all insects, annelids, mollusks, a gigantic branch of the tree of life. Uh, but in our branch, a couple of unusual things happen. The body flipped dorsal ventrally, and the neural plate, which wound up on the dorsal side, folded into a tube, creating the basic architecture or bow plan of all chordate nervous systems. Um, so all of our nervous systems are topologically a tube composed of these segments called neuromeres um, uh, with both a sort of an alar more sensory read part and a basal more uh, motor part. This can be, this is quite easily seen in the dorsal versus ventral root of the spinal cord, but it's also true for the rest of the brain uh, albeit much more convoluted because of all the de developmental uh, complexities. Um, and if we examine the amphioxus, which is a primitive chordate that diverged from us something like six, more than 600 million years ago, and then remained in its relatively simple filter feeding niche, uh, we can get a window into what these early chordates were like. According to Lacalli and others, it was essentially like a hypothalamus attached to a spinal cord. Um, sort of uh, secreting hormones to control different modes of behavior, um, foraging around, filter feeding. These animals also possessed an escape circuit, um, starting with a single patch of photosensitive cells, 
projecting to um, a structure called the tectum, which then projected downstream. Uh, by the way, I forgot to explain. This is kind of like the neural tube unfolded. So you can see, sort of see this is the floor plate and this is the roof plate unfolded out. Anyway, um, so now with this organization, if a shadow fell on the animal, that would stimulate this escape circuit to quickly swim away. Um, early vert and early vertebrates, this single patch split into two that migrated to the sides of the head, according to Ann Butler and others. Um, and the initial um, bilateral projections became primarily contralateral. So they have contralateral projections to attack them, ipsilateral projections downstream, which means that you will avoid things. So for example, if you have a shadow falling on your left eye, you will then turn to the right and you'll continue turning until you've oriented yourself away from that thing and then you can escape uh, very effectively. Um, later, this retinotectal uh, uh, system became more topographic for having more oriented visual avoidance. Um, and at some point, a specialization happened where the rostral part of the tectum uh, projected contralateral, not ipsilateral. So now you have two systems, essentially. You have an avoidance system, contralateral, ipsilateral avoidance system, and a contralateral, contralateral system, which means you'll turn towards the source of stimulation. And you could still see these, uh, literally in lamprey, zebrafish, even mammals, where the tectum is called the superior colliculus, which have a, a kind of a lateral superior colliculus that cro with crossed connections for approach and a medial with ipsilateral projections for avoidance. Um, now, <clears throat> these two systems have different kinds of dynamics, and I'll call these pragmatic representations. They're not representations in the traditional sense because they, they're not really decodable externally, um, but they accomplish a, a functional goal. So for avoidance, you want to have uh, a map where things on the left make you turn right, things on the right make you turn left. And interestingly, if you have multiple threat things you want to avoid bumping into, well, then averaging is a good uh, way of dealing with it. So averaging dynamics of the avoidance map are adaptive. But that's not going to work for approach, right? If you have an item over here you want to approach and another item over here that might want to approach, you don't want to go down the center. Then that gets you nothing. So averaging doesn't work. For this map, you need some kind of winner-take-all dynamics. You need some kind of competition whereby, let's say, one group of cells suppresses the other group of cells, et cetera, so that you move towards one target um, exclusively. Um, now notice at this point, we could call this attention because it's kind of like you're ignoring something and focusing on one other thing. We could call it intention because that's where you intend to go. We could call it decision-making. Of course, it doesn't matter for this creature what philosophers half a billion years later would call it. Uh, it just wants to get at the food. Um, and of course, the superior colliculus and the tectum are in fact implicated in all these functions. Um, so <clears throat> the conclusion so far is that we're building up a different model of brain functions. It's not about knowledge acquisition or representation of the external world. It's really about control of interactions. That's what's the fundamental thing. Um, and it doesn't really focus on serial computations of things like coding and decoding, but rather nested feedback control loops where the representations are not descriptive. They don't, they don't actually capture knowledge, but they're pragmatic. They're implicitly um, capture everything that's necessary to guide the behavior. And we're getting a different conceptual taxonomy. It's not these kinds of things. It's something like this, which is a, really a summary of my talk so far of how um, different types of metabolism and different types of behavioral systems diverged in and specialized in our ancestors. And the important thing here is that this actually does map fairly well to the kind the nervous systems that existed at that time. Um, now in vertebrates, so now this, this is a side view of the chordate neural tube. Um, and here's uh, in, in sort of a amphioxus-like chordate. Um, and in vertebrates, what happens is you get a telencephalon um, over here, which is actually an expansion of part of the hypothalamus. I didn't know this, but it turns out the whole telencephalon, cerebral cortex and everything is actually a bulge out of the hypothalamus developmentally. And it consists of a pallium, an external sec sector called the pallium, which receives sensory information, and an internal thing called the subpallium, which projects downstream to select between the different tectal systems for approach and avoidance. And this part here, the subpallium, will become the basal ganglia as well as some other structures. 
Um, and so, uh, and importantly, in early vertebrates, there was also a new type of dopaminergic input, not just a tonic signal that says things are good, stay where you are, or things are not so good, go somewhere else, but rather a more phasic punctate a reinforcement saying what you just did in this current state was extra good. So if you find yourself in that state, do it again. Uh, and of course, that allows you now to learn what states, you what things you should approach, what things you should avoid. Um, <clears throat> and that was important. Now, the, the pallium um, specialized uh, fairly early on into at least two systems, a ventral lateral system um, focusing on doing all the stuff locally. So learning, for example, what ethologists call the key stimuli, the combinations of features that specify that this is something you might want to approach versus avoid. Um, learning these kinds of things about the local interactions within your immediate environment. Um, the, in addition, the medial pallium became specialized for this more long range exploration thing, using things like odor gradients and landmarks to move to new locations. And this part will become the hippocampus. And of course, these work together still with the spatial maps of the tectum that really govern the moment to moment visual motor behavior of these animals. Um, the uh, <clears throat> jawed vertebrates added a cerebellum, which conferred predictive control or what we call forward models that can predict the consequence of action. This is very important. I'm gonna skip over it quickly, uh, but it is it was very important to allow our animals, our ancestors to become very effective predators and enlarge their bodies and move faster and swim faster, et cetera. Um, upon getting out on land, our ancestors um, entered a much more complex world with uh, new demands. Um, it, leading to an expansion, particular in the kinds of key stimuli that were used to, to guide movement in the, in the external world. Much more visual, because of the expansion of visual range, they could do much more sophisticated things with it. Um, in um, <clears throat> amniotes, um, I would suggest that in addition to the processing of these sort of simple kind of key stimuli, um, uh, one part of the pallium, the so called dorsal pallium, um, started to specialize for picking up affordances. Okay, so affordances are what Gibson called the sort of features of the world that um, inform an animal about potential actions it can take, uh, things like graspable objects, etc. But for these animals, of course, it's long before grasping. But you can imagine, for example, hideability. Okay, um, and for this animal to know that this thing here is a place to hide, it doesn't actually have to build a full-fledged 3D model of that external world uh, in some kind of a, a geometric in a representation. It really just has to do relatively simple um, detection of certain relationships. Like for example, that there's a contrast edge in the visual field where below that edge, things are darker than above that edge. And furthermore, if you then move forward, the texture above the edge is moving faster than the texture below the edge. And if that edge is above the point of visual expansion, well, then it's likely to be a place you can hide. So you can do this kinds of, these kinds of things and detect things like a place to hide without full-fledged uh, visual systems, uh, just to pick up on specific affordances that are relevant uh, for behavior, for example, if you feel threatened. Um, so um, a lot of these kinds of things were going on in our, our early amniotes, um, I would proposed. Um, <clears throat> now, at this stage, the major moment-to-moment -moment control is really still through this sort of midbrain. Um, visual motor control is mostly through this sort of midbrain circuit. And the telencephalon is mostly providing modul modulatory modulation of it, uh, turning on approach and avoidance and orientation. Am I oriented towards something I want to approach or not? Um, and very much driven by this visual system. But when mammals um, came about, mammals uh, retreated into a nocturnal world. Um, in part, I guess, because there were giant dinosaurs stomping around. But um, <clears throat> what our ancestors did is they retreated into the nocturnal world and they relied less on this uh, visual pathway and more on things like uh, olfactory and somatosensory and, and uh, auditory. And they also expanded the projections downstream from this dorsal pallium. 
So now it became more than just an affordance detector and could actually modify and the metrics of particular actions. It became more of an action controller on its own, um, supplanting some of the role of the, of the superior calipers. And furthermore, mammals also elaborated this kind of closed loop pathway to the basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia now, not just, act, not just selecting movements to the midbrain, could actually select the activity back in the dorsal pallium, which became the neocortex, what we call the neocortex. Um, now, <clears throat> um, John Kaz, uh, Rhea Krubitzer, and others have suggested that the neocortex of early um, mammals was organized in terms of certain somatomotor maps uh, with different um, uh, somatotopy. So, so mouth to, to hind limb, mouth to hind limb, multiple maps of space uh, of, of the body, as well as um, visual and auditory regions. Um, and these, um, this sort of six layer core cortex was surrounded by a kind of this granular regions, including cingulate, retrosplenial, perirhinal, insular, orbital, et cetera, and of course, piriform over here. Um, now, <clears throat> I would propose that these uh, different systems were specialized for different kinds of activity, it became specialized for different kinds of visual motor activity. Uh, for example, searching around for food versus feeding and eating things. So um, uh, again, this kind of trade-off is the thing that I'm um, that's near me, that I'm oriented to, worth eating, or should I go, go somewhere else? Um, and then in between, a kind of um, a system for, for handling behaviors, which is what, what ethologists call handling things like digging through the ground or grasping something and bringing it towards you. Uh, as well as perhaps defensive behaviors. Uh, and these would receive different information about uh, sort of the, the kind of visual information useful for specifying these kinds of actions. Um, uh, in addition to this, you of course have to also select the action that you need to do. Um, uh, and this could be informed by another kind of vi visual processing where again, you just like before, you collect information about the key stimuli about the thing that you might be oriented to, and then you can decide, is that something worth getting? It, should I, given this thing that I'm oriented to, should I engage my feeding system or should I go look for something better? Um, so now you can see that this is already starting to look familiar, right? This is, looks like the two visual systems uh, of Milner and Goodale, where there's a kind of a dorsal stream uh, that's all about action control and a ventral stream that's all about sort of recognition of objects and identifying what you might want to do at a given time. Um, now, selection um, has to happen at, at, at least two levels. One is selection between the maps. What kind of behavior am I going to engage in right now? I'm going to feed, or am I going to run around, or am I going to do something else? And I would suggest that this um, kind of selection was mediated by the basal ganglia. So um, through these kinds of uh, loops that invigorate large rostrocaudal patches of cortex, through these thalamocortical projections, um, essentially selecting out what kind of activity you want to do in the current state. Um, and this architecture, by the way, is also recapitulated from many other parts of the forebrain, including amygdala circuits, hippocampal septal sy systems, et cetera. <clears throat> but now, if you've selected, let's say, to search, then it's still a task now where exactly you're going to go. And I would suggest that that's done within the kinds of representation of space um, that's created, sort of idiosyncratic, specific to the, the task of searching uh, through actual competition happening within that action map. Um, by the way, I should say that the idea of these action maps is really um, pioneered by Graziano, uh, but since then also um, reinforced by Kaz and others. Um, anyway, so the point is that within each of these action maps, you have cells that might vote for different actions, and they have the right kind of spatial geometry to solve that problem. And, and let me show you what that might look like, let's say, for running around in the world. Suppose you're this mouse, and you're in this environment with these obstacles. You can imagine in your map of running potential running directions, here are potential running directions. These are not good running directions. So there's a kind of a desirability density function kind of like a probability density function across the space of potential actions, but it's kind of like a desirability um, uh, weighted. So in other words, these are desirable directions, these are not. So now in this condition, 
there's no decision to be made. You just you just kind of average down the center. Uh, but as you move, of course, that landscape is changing. Now here you can still continue going down the center, but at some point the landscape become, becomes split. It sort of bifurcates into two kinds of um, hills of potential actions that are useful. Now you have to make a more or less uh, winner take all type decision to go one way or the other. It might be biased by things like threats or noises or cues. Um, now, the, therefore, the choices themselves in this kind of decisions emerge from the geometry and continuously change as you run through the world. Uh, so it's a different kind of decision making than what's normally um, studied. Also, I want to point out that although you might say that, you know, in some cases you could pre-plan your decision and make this plan, in general, you can't really do that because the world might change on you. Things might move. And then you have to be able to re-specify the landscape and select between different activities all simultaneously, all at once. Um, you must specify the potential actions, select the, between them in parallel. And this idea uh, was essentially the basis of, of my work, uh, including with John Kalaska, on what we call the affordance competition hypothesis. So finally, I can say something about my own work. Um, anyway, we've suggested that the primate brain, the dorsal stream, is essentially doing this kind of specification of potential actions as hills of activity, of tuned activity, let's say in the reaching system or in the uh, locomotor system, uh, where the different cell groups compete against each other, biased by things like selection signals from other parts of the brain, including things like object identity. Um, and therefore, uh, allowing one action to be um, released uh, but at the same time, still considering other possibilities in case circumstances change. Um, all right, so now primates return to the diurnal world, uh, but instead of uh, using the superior colliculus, they, um, as heavily as our ancestors did, they elaborated what they had in the, in the cortex. The cortex expanded dramatically in the temporal and frontal direction, so much so that it curled around the insula, creating this sort of classic um, primate brain shape. And there was a massive expansion of the behavioral repertoire to all the different kinds of activities that um, primates can do, um, in, in part because they're visual ability. Um, uh, so locomotion, reaching, grasp, defense, et, et cetera, as, as again, Graziano and many others have suggested. <clears throat> now, uh, I just want to show you, um, and there's a recent paper from the group of Caminiti um, showing in, in some detail these different action systems. And they have their own projections to, to, the, to the spinal cord. So there's a kind of a reaching system that involves BMD um, and MIP, et cetera. There's a grasping system with more ventral premotor. There's a defensive system, as well as a locomotor system on the midline, including areas like retrosplenial, cingulate motor areas that are highly interconnected with the uh, interrhinal cortex of hippocampus and so on. Um, so now these systems for different kinds of activities receive also specific visual streams that, that have the kind of spatial information that they need. Um, and, uh, but in addition to this, this expansion, there was also an expansion of the processing of key stimuli towards full-fledged object classification, but still in, in the service of uh, estimating values and helping you make uh, decisions. Um, <clears throat> One thing I want to emphasize here is that be, because primates had these large eyes, um, movable eyes, and this sophisticated visual system, visual processing, they, um, they could do more than forage like our ancestors of scurrying around and bumping into things and sniffing them. They could forage with gaze. They could look around, appraise things from far away, and make choices about what actions they might want to do. And because vision, the direction of gaze is so important for all these other systems, this system here takes on a kind of executive role, which is often ascribed to this concept of attention. Um, <clears throat> okay, what about cognition though, right? I mean, humans can do very abstract tasks that, that have very little with moment-to-moment uh, -moment behavior. Um, and it's possible that humans developed a cognitive system on top of all this that's just different. Uh, but I would suggest that given the fact that it's been continuous all along, can we take it um, further? And uh, here's an example. Suppose you're this monkey, you're sitting in this tree, and you have a berry over here and some apples. Here's your brain. The berry and the apple might indicate various values that you might want to obtain. The apple might be more attractive. Um, whereas the dorsal stream is telling you, well, there's a reachable berry, 
Uh, but the apples are out of reach. There's no reachable apple, but there is a walkable branch, right? Now, if you can predict that reaching for the berry gives you a certain outcome, well, that's good, and you can reach for that berry, and that's fine. You, you can eat the berry, and you'll, you'll do well. But if you're slightly more sophisticated, then you can predict that walking out on the branch brings the things in front closer. Uh, and therefore, you can predict that if you take advantage of this affordance of the branch, you will make an apple reachable, and then that will yield you a better outcome. And so it's a kind of a one-step look ahead. It's a little bit like one step in chess, looking ahead uh, that gives you a slight advantage. Uh, and P Giovanni Pizzullo and I have suggested that this is sort of the expansion of the frontal lobe is kind of giving you this. We're not the only ones, of course, that have suggested this, Carl Friston and others as well. Uh, and so predicted affordances are what's going on over here, more, more abstracted levels of, of action control. All right, so now from this perspective, we can revisit some of those neural challenges. Um, why is there a ventral dorsal stream? Well, because this one is specifying, dorsal specifying actions and ventral is gathering information for selecting. Why are things mixed up? Well, because these regions are sensory, motor, and they're competing against each other based be, because of all these different types of selection activity between the systems and within them. And so they're gonna be colored by all kinds of estimates of value, et cetera, that look cognitive. Um, why are things um, happening at once? Because life is not like an experiment in which there's a stimulus and there's a response. There's continuous activity, and the system is really designed to be a continuous feedback control system uh, where everything is kind of uh, distributed. Um, so binding can be coordinated by virtue of being embodied. If you orient towards something, your ventral system can tell you what that is, and your dorsal system will know how to deal with it. Um, so you don't need explicit binding mechanisms, um, of, at least for this type of binding problem. Grounding is, is accomplished because uh, the sensory activity is dynamically coupled with the world. It has a purpose. It actually has, the meaning is never um, detached. What about explicit knowledge? Uh, in the interest of, of time, I'm going to skip through uh, explicit knowledge, although I could come back. I'll just summarize to say that the concept of representations is often uh, discussed in debates between very extreme viewpoints. And I would suggest perhaps we think of it as a, a continuum from the very pragmatic thing that of course is there in the brain, things that co-vary with the external world, of course have to be there in any system that's dynamically coupled with the world and dealing with the world. So these pragmatic things have to be there. On the other hand, there are some cases where things might become increasingly descriptive and detached from the details of that world. Things like, um, this might include things like representations of food when you're hungry and where they are with respect to you, and all those contextual mixing, which is what you ultimately need in order to feed yourself when you're hungry. But descriptive representations might just say, well, this is food, take a note of it because maybe you'll wanna come back later. Um, but one thing which I think is particularly difficult for this kind of view is the question of language. Where does language come into here? Um, and language really seems like sort of the, the classic uh, indisputable input-output process. But I would suggest, and many have suggested, that language can also be seen as feedback control. So I've described physiology as feedback control within the body, behavior as feedback control uh, through the environment, and we can think of communication as feedback control through other creatures. So imagine you're this, you're a human, helpless human baby, and you can't get this thing by yourself. But fortunately, in your niche, there's something called a parent, which will happily do whatever you need um, to, to uh, feed yourself or help yourself. And all you need to do is make some noise, and that parent will come over and provide whatever it is that you need. And the nice thing here is that the parent is incredibly sophisticated. So you can get very complex effects with very simple cues that you just need to provide to that parent. Just make a noise, cry, and the parent will do whatever it takes. Um, in other words, if you have a behavior control system in which the environmental part of this, the, the feedback includes this benevolent and very complex agent, then you can get very complex effects, very complex action outcomes by very simple actions. You just need to utter some kind of a symbol. And importantly, that symbol can be very compact. It doesn't have to have all the information. You, have to, you don't have to tell the parent how exactly to grasp the bottle and how to hold it or 
where to go to the grocery store. The parent will take care of all of that. All you have to say is, I'm hungry. And so it becomes inherently categorical and symb symbolic. And you can accomplish these things because the creatures you interact with um, are sophisticated but predictable. Um, and this repertoire expands with each generation um, and becoming very sophisticated. And so even though we can do many things with language, um, fundamentally communication is really about persuasion. Uh, and, I would, and I think this talk is actually an example because I'm trying to persuade you about um, thinking about a different model of brain function. So it's not coding and decoding representations. Uh, it's not fundamentally about coding and encoding of stuff. It's really about control of interactions. And along the way, and the task is to control the input by output through the environment, to complement the what's going on in the world. And therefore, most representations are really pragmatic. They're all mixed up, um, mixed up variables. They're not easily externally decodable, except in some cases, in some specific cases. Uh, the modules that we find in the brain are not going to be information processing modules that send coded messages to each other, but rather nested feedback control groups that always sort of bounce through the environment. The functional parts are not going to be computational stages so much as ethologically relevant circuits, uh, where the dynamics are primary, not the representations that they produce. And that the evolution of behavior is the continuous extension of control, and that cognition evolves from this as well, which is something, of course, Piaget said um, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and so we have a different conceptual taxonomy. It's not this. It's something like this, which is the summary of my talk. Um, and the advantage of this one is that it respects evolutionary history. So each of these is actually a specialization modification of an earlier uh, stage. And it also happens to map quite well, I would say, to the actual structures that we see in the brain, including specific parts of the cerebral cortex. So I think it provides a better fit to neural data and a better um, sort of foundation for asking questions. Uh, now, I know this was way too fast. Uh, if you're interested, there's a few papers so far that describe this. Uh, I'm also working on a book, which should be done, God knows how many years from now. Uh, but anyway, I'd like to thank you for attention. And